Okay. What I'm about to say or explain is, is going to be considered extremely radical, um, even by, uh, I think, uh, even by far stretches of the imagination, it's going to be considered radical. But I promise that um, it'll be an interesting talk, and you're, you're more than welcome to leave your microphones on for uh, even general discussion as we go along, and you don't have to wait till the end. It might be more fun and more engaging that way. So if you see something right away, I don't mind pausing the current slide and maybe extrapolating on it for another 30 seconds or so, um, just so you know. Okay, it is my sincerest hope that, it is my sincerest hope that after my presentation, I would have been successful in showing you the dimension of time and articulating what makes it so special. Uh, these five bodies here are going to be my companions on this journey. We have uh, Mr. Black Hole, Mr. Neutron Star, our sun or a star, planet Earth and the moon. Um, so time. Einstein said time was relative. You know, the faster you go or the more mass you have, the slower time flows in that region. Newton said time was absolute, that 12 o'clock here was the same as 12 o'clock on Mars and so forth. Our bodies moved in unison. So to two totally different views, you know, and so on. So I'm gonna use both these differing views to uh, make the my ultimate point. So, but these two views I, I need to kind of explain them a little bit separately a little bit first and then fuse them together. Since um, Einstein's view is more accepted, you know, we'll start there. As I mentioned, uh, the, the heavier body is, the slower time runs in that region. Uh, black hole, of course, is the greatest. Coming down the neutron star, the sun, the earth, the moon has the least. But what is time dilation? I mean, at its core, because if I could go down to each and every one of those bodies and step foot on it, I mean, minus the, if I was invincible and could actually stand on this gravity well that strong, I still would, I would observe my clock running normally. I wouldn't be talking in slow motion or my clock or so. Time is still a second for me. Time is moving normally. So what's really happening, you know? You know, from an outside point of view, it looks like time is running slow there. But if I was to go there, I wouldn't, I wouldn't notice that. So what happened, what I believe happened, when Einstein created his general theory of relativity, at the time he didn't know that the Big Bang existed. Uh, it, it was only discovered that the universe was expanding when, when Hubble, when he, when he finally uh, met up with Hubble and learned that. And then he changed his whole gravitational concept. But at his conception, the world didn't know that the universe was expanding. It didn't know that the universe had a beginning just yet. So if Einstein could have saw the Big Bang and he went to each of these different bodies, he could have stood on it. And if he could have looked back, starting with Earth, he would have saw that the Big Bang was right there. It had a certain brightness, but it was, it was, it was uh, measurable. If you went to the moon, something's different. It got brighter. The moon is brighter. So, right enough. We want to it keep in, uh, pay attention to this one point. It'll be important later that the moon got brighter. Uh, if he goes to the sun, dimmer. If he goes to neutron star, dimmer. If he goes to a black hole, nothing. Why is this happening? So. Time dilation is just an object's position in time. A black hole exists in the far future, but you can only measure that by referencing something in time that never changes and measure the object's position relative to it, in this case, the Big Bang. At its essence, time can be measured as distance to the Big Bang, but you can't walk there. You can't even take a spaceship there. The Big Bang only exists in the past, but depending on the amount of mass, a time dilation that an object has, determines that object absolute distance away from it. 
black holes, if the time was a road, black holes are way, 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 way down the road at mile marker near infinity. The sun is at mile marker 100. The earth is at mile marker 20. The moon is at mile marker four. You know, fictitious values, but you get the idea. However, at mile marker zero, the Big Bang is there. And that position never changes. And if we can use it, if you use it as a lighthouse, you can measure how far down the road of time objects are. So, I gotta bring Newton back in here. So Einstein said time was relative. Newton said time was absolute. You know, it, sh it but you have to combine the two views. If Newton was born way, way too early, he never learned about the universe expanding. He didn't know, know what time dilation was. He didn't know about the Big Bang. He was, he was never going to solve gravity. Never. Einstein, he, had, he knew about time dilation, but he, he, he made general relativity before the Big Bang was thought of. So he didn't see, if he, he didn't see this last little piece of the puzzle. So if you combine the two views, which again is Einstein's you know, relativistic time, time slowing down, and you, Newton's view, where everything's absolute, this is the dimension of time. I'm gonna remove these lines so it's easier to see. Remember how I said the moon is, was, the, the Big Bang was brighter for the moon. The moon is in the past. It's closer to the Big Bang. That's why it was it was brighter. Everything else is. This is the dimension of time. This is the, the moon is literally in the past. Our sun is literally in the future. And so that moon is closer because it was always closer to the Big Bang. It was the only body that was closer. Every object past that got dimmer until it went down. The moon is the only one that went up in brightness because it's closer to the Big Bang. These are arbitrary values. This is the dimension of time. This is, think of them as the, these are the mile markers. The moon is four units away from the Big Bang. Earth is 20 units away from the Big Bang. The sun is 100. Neutron star is a million. The black hole is way, way up there. Keep an eye on the units. I need to bring this back into our normal view of, of three-dimensional space, but keep an eye on the units. The moon is in the past. So, going with that train of thought, this is the dimension of time again, and combining Einstein relativistic time and Newton's they're not all at 12 o'clock, but they're all moving through time at the same uniform speed. So, in the Earth-Moon system, each body experiences a different amount of time dilation due to the amount of mass each possesses. As such, Earth's greater time dilation, its mass, means it exists at a position in time that's slightly further in the future than that of the Moon's position in time. The Moon, in the past, it's drawn to the future located here at Earth's center. Therefore, due to time dilation, gravity is the attraction between objects that are in different temporal locations drawn together by the charge of time. However, we have a problem. This is not what we see every day when we talk about what's causing gravity. We say that there's a warping in this, in this fabric, um, that there's something that's bending, but Physics, physics is a science of observations. And uh, I've never seen warp space, but a good smoking gun for warp space would be if the angles of triangles didn't add up to 180 degrees anymore. I, I have never seen that. And I don't think anyone's ever seen that. So, but I understand this is just one man fighting a, a whole history of what we think is causing gravity. But Einstein himself never believed it. After doing a lot of bunch of digging, this is a direct quote from Einstein. He was reviewing a book by Emily Myerson, uh, La Duction, or really this, it was French. Einstein liked the book a lot. He only objected to Myerson's view as general theory as geographical, I mean, geometrical. 
he was, he, I would like to be, deal more closely with the last point because I have entirely different opinion on the matter. I cannot namely admit that the assertion that the theory of relativity traces back to geometry has a clear meaning. Going to the underline, the fact that the metric center is denoted as ge ge <laughs> geometrical is simply connected to the fact that this formal structure first appeared in a study denoted as geometry. He borrowed the tools from geometry to, to put his thing together, but he never said there was some physical thing there bending. These two guys were the ones who went out and put forward that it's a geomer geometrical concept, there's a fabric, and he went into all the textbooks. All his life, Einstein disagreed with this move. You know, a closer reading says he never changed his mind. My work follows this source here. Uh, uh, Dennis, I'm, I'm not even going to try to butcher his name, but I thank you for his work. He's, uh, he deals with the Einstein Papers Project. Uh, he wrote a paper on it, why Einstein did not believe generally the Germatrage's gravity. So even Einstein didn't believe there was some sort of something bending there. It just got stuck in the history books. So this, right, but I'm claiming something that's never been seen before. And so before I come back and sound like the village idiot, I better make sure I know how to at least measure this thing to quantify it, put it in an equation. This part right here almost drove me crazy. Okay. To measure the temple charge, and the attraction it causes between objects in different temporal locations. We need to identify the absolute position in time of every object. The further in time an object's position, the greater its temporal charge. As such, the higher the magnitude of temporal charge in a system of objects, mass, the greater the product of attraction between those objects divided by the spatial distance we're separating them. To locate this absolute temporal position, we need a common lighthouse in time that's the same in all reference frames. For this, we use the Big Bang as every object in time is an absolute distance away from it, depending on the amount of time dilation of that object. Therefore, by measuring the magnitude of the object's time dilation, we can determine that object's distance to the Big Bang, thus its absolute position in time. So, to calculate this absolute position in time for object, we use the following function. The greater the velocity of an object, or the subsequent velocity needed to escape the gravitational field of an object in question, the greater that object's time dilation. Therefore, by measuring either velocity as a function of the speed of light, we can determine the amount of time dilation for that object also as a function of the speed of light. This in turn corresponds to the object's distance to the Big Bang, hence its absolute temporal position, and I've denoted this value R naught. R naught simply says uh, the more gravity you have, the, the further in the future you are. But that time is a charge that you collect the further you go into the future. This equation uh, solves for that. But for any successful theory of gravity to be anywhere near successful, it would have to do something that no other theory has done before. before. And just making this, playing around with it, an equation popped out all by itself. I didn't even go, I didn't even think to go looking for it. It just happened. For any successful theory of gravity to be but taken seriously, it has to be able to define mass as gravity and it are intimately linked. This is the equation for mass. Because additionally, as mass is in, in time are intrinsically woven together, this is the calculation for it. It signifies that this, that as R naught increases, which is just temple charge, you 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 get your mass. Everything in this equation is a constant, constant, constant. This time is the only thing that's changing in this equation. This is my sample equations. But let's see what it did the Earth. What it says is that you take the escape velocity of Earth. You turn it into a percentage of, of speed of light. You then input this value into the equation for R naught. It gives, this is the charge. This is the temporal charge of Earth right here, this number. You plug this temporal charge into the equation for mass, and given that mass, Earth's radius, there is the mass of the Earth. Which leads to something a little bit more startling. 
given that E equals MC square, this indicates that time is literally energy woven into mass. I was scared when I first knew that, when I first realized, thought that might be what it's saying. I thought I would spice it up a little bit and they could just straight slides, but this is an accurate description of R naught. These are what these bodies are, would be on this curve. Time is a charge, it has energy, and and the more mass you have, or you know, or faster you're going, you can gain that charge. As artistically as I could envision it, this is literally what it is. The Big Bang is way down there. The moon is close to it. Earth is a little bit further, so, but this is the dimension of time. If anyone wants to read my paper or, you know, I, I left a zip file here at my personal domain, well, my company domain that I own. Uh, in it, it has my paper, it has a copy of these slides, and it has the a copy of the paper of the reference I used from the dentist who says Einstein didn't believe in geometry or time. I included all that, but I would love to hear your thoughts on it. Anybody? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Tony. Thank you very much. It takes uh, two seconds to turn on uh, the microphone, and uh, uh, I presume that uh, okay, guys, go ahead with your question, please. Yeah, I've got a question, Stephen. Here, um, so in, in essence, you're saying that the idea of the Big Bang represents the ultimate reference for every point in space in regard to time. And, and, and not so much this point, yeah, space too, but mostly time. It's, it's literally the first event. There was no time before. It is the beginning of time. I mean, if you, if you, if you time is infinite going the other direction, but all I need is one marker to kind of figure out where things are inside of it. And the Big Bang accomplishes that. Mm. Tony, this is Manfred. Um, as far as I understood, uh, you say that time is um, gravitation somehow. Yes. Right. Yes. Exactly. Um, so, is um, what do you mean by distance from Big Bang to the position in time is related to gravitational force or the passing of time? Uh, let's just do the distance part first and not the passing part. The distance, the Big Bang only exists in one place. You, you, you can't get there in, in, in space, well, no matter how hard you try. It only exists in time, but it's the first event. You know, there's nothing, let me put it another way. In some weird universe, if the Big Bang for that universe happened in the, the middle of time, it's a pointless marker because it's, it's infinity in front of it, it's, it's, if, it's, if, it's, if it's infinity behind it. I can't say that something is uh, 200 feet from it, you know, if it's in the middle of something that I don't even know how big it is in the first place. But with the Big Bang, I, I know when it is, I, kn I know where it is, and everything that has a, a differing amount of mass uh, is, is it's dependent on its mass, how far it's away from it. So a black hole is way down the road from it. It's, it's near infinity in, in the future, way down the road. Our sun is a lot closer to the Big Bang because it's not as, it doesn't have as much mass. You know, every, the event horizon of a black hole exists in the future. And if you just roll that train of thought back, you know, you know things with less mass, a neutron star is... Well, it's, it's, it's not a lot like a black hole, but it's more in the future than most objects in space because it's so heavy. And because it's so heavy, it's further forward in time. Just don't try to see that just yet. Just know that it's time dilation by the math makes it ahead in time. But ahead in time compared to what? I can't say ahead of time compared to the Earth because that's just relative depending on how you look at it. But I can always say it's ahead of time and ahead of the Big Bang because nothing is before the Big Bang.
so what what caused the big bang I, I i don't go into that i'm not here to i'm not i'm, I'm not here to <laughs> describe what the big bang was and I, i don't really need to know i just need to know that it was the beginning i just need to know that there it is i need to know that it's zero on a counter that i can count increments going forward you know be it near infinity like if a, if a neutron star is a million measurements away from the big bang i can count that you know i can i can see the distance in this picture here that i have as you see the little moon is back there because it's it's further backwards it's further it's closer to the big bang than everything else is because it's further back in the past because it has such little mass compared to the rest of everything else Uh, do you see a future event happening with this model? Do you see a um, uh, an occurrence of all the events that are taking place with time at the moment? Is there a um, an uh, an end event in in your model? Are you asking me? Is there another singularity at the end of the universe? Yeah. Is your steady state? Is it? Open I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't think. I don't think anyone can ever answer that question. Not. Not a hundred percent. I. I can't. I, I, we can't predict the future, and if I can't predict the future, I can't see the future. But th we know about the Big Bang. We know about the history of our universe. But we do. We look at it every day through telescopes. You know, Hubble view and everything. This is something we we know very well. Um, I think what I'm asking is: Is there a pattern in time that is predictable in terms of what's happened before? Can can that be looked at with what you're suggesting as time dilation into the future? Um. In theory, you could park some weird telescope really close to a black hole because it's there. It's literally seeing things in the future, and you could and you could beam that out to your place in the past. You might be able to do something like that, um, but I never got that far in the thought process. To I, as you're asking me, how could I use this to make it a technology? Um, I I will only be speculating at this point. It was just hard enough getting to this point before I decided to make a lightsaber out of it. Uh, I didn't go that far with it, but I think once anything becomes understandable, at least measurable, it's only a matter of time before we, as the species that we are, learn to do something with it. I mean, look at the atom bomb, you know. So, but I still would like, you know, for someone else to take a look at it, you know, and. Because I might be missing something, you know. I, there's something maybe I can't see. The only thing that convinces me more than anything is is this thing right here. That. Um, and all all that R R not is is just uh, Earth's temporal position in time. Is temporal charge. If that charge was to go up, if that R zero was to go up, depending on how much the radius is, it, it would. It could. If it got up to one, that would become a black hole that was big enough. But Earth's R not is low. Um, a neutron star, for example, a neutron star's R not is like 0 0.09, uh, and that's just based on. I can. I can show you this. I don't mind showing you this. I wrote it here. Nope, go back. There it is. Um, so this is my paper. is in a zip file that I'll, I'll put on screen again so anyone wants to read it. But um, in my sample equations, here, let me make this bigger. You can still see my screen, right? Yeah. Okay, so these are my sample equations. The one for Earth, I put in there. But this is the, uh, the R0 for a neutron star. And all it is, you just take its, its escape velocity, you divide it by you know the speed of light to get the percentage of the speed of light. Uh, once you have that, let me make this bigger. Yeah. Once you have the neutron star's uh, velocity, you know, which is, equates to its time dilation, uh, you can get its you can get its temporal charge, which is 0 0.09. Now that you know that, and you know if you just know the neutron star's size. Uh, you can predict its mass. Oh, oh, let me put this back on here. 
the paper makes a few other startling, um, um, I guess we're gonna, if we're gonna go yeehaw, we must go yeehaw. The paper makes other startling predictions based on it. Um, uh, this is certain to find inertia and gravity is just attraction between objects that are in different turbo locations. Uh, all clocks seek the least, all clocks seek the least resistance to move forward in time. Uh, gravitational lensing, if, if there is no warping, there's no curvature to space time, as Einstein believed, as there seems to be no telltale proof. Gravitational lensing and tidal force are just caused by clocks being drawn to a common future. Uh, light always wants to just go forward in time. And so when it passes something massive, be it a, a black hole or a star, it, it, it bends towards it, not because there's some hill that's it's bending that's forcing it from going straight. It wants to go there. It, 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 it wants to go forward in time as efficiently as it can. And this gravitational well accomplishes that because of its time dilation. So uh, anything which experiences the same amount of time dilation uh, experiences the same absolute now, no matter where they are in the universe. So if even if Earth is on the other side of the universe, as long as we have the exact same mass, we have the exact same time dilation, which means we are at the exact same distance from the Big Bang. That is an absolute now. Space and time are not woven into a single one-to-one -one fabric. An object can be at a given distance away spatially, but it exists at a different location temporally. Uh, for example, if the sun was converted into a black hole spatially, it would be 149 billion years away, but uh, temporally the black pole would exist in the far future uh, due to its extreme time dilation. So space and time are not woven into a uniform fabric. Uh, time is a separate dimension from that of three-dimensional space with its own coordinates. So if you reference anything in space, you should indicate time as a complex number. Um, gravitational acceleration, I thought this one was really cool. Gravitational acceleration is just the rate at which an object falls into the future at that region, uh, which is proportional to R0. On Earth, that rate is 9.87 meters per second square. Oppositely, anything exiting a gravitational field is traveling backwards in time from that region and thereby loses energy in doing so which is gravitational register. Now, number six is, is freaky. So I, I take this one with a grain of salt. To reconcile gravity with quantum mechanics, a boson for gravity needs to exist to graviton. However, gravity, the warp in space-time, that does not exist, a notion that Einstein himself did not believe. This is the paper that I referenced, by the way. As such, the above equation is, is significant. Given E equals mc squared, it indicates that time is energy woven into mass. Thus, what has been discovered is a quantum field of time describing R0 as a boson for time. This field and its excitation are responsible for imbuing mass with energy, time dilation as it is accelerated or accumulated in a volume of space, and subsequently transporting mass forward in time. R0 is literally entropy itself. The equation also indicates that regardless of radius, I don't care how big you are, anything which experiences zero time also experiences zero mass, like the photon. Therefore, time is responsible for halting mass from moving at the speed of light. Given the universe this depth, you know, if not, it would be over instantly. It, it would, what would be the point? And that is my paper. As I said, it's in my zip file, uh, which I will, this is the paper, by the way, that I reference. Um, but it's also I have a copy of it in my zip file. Um, and the zip file can be checked out here. Uh, just phoenixsequence.com, this is the name of my company, and forward slash time. It's right on the root. That's one to make it easy, uh, all lowercase. But that's, that's what I've been working on for the last seven to eight months. Anybody? Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, Tony, I, 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 I'm. Uh, well, you say essentially you say that uh, the moon is in different time than the sun, right? Different time than us. The moon is behind us in the past. Everyone has their own now. So from our because we're on Earth, for, and at this point in time on Earth, 
the moon is in our past. And somewhere between the, 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 where is the sun? The sun is in the future. It's heavier. It has, it has more time dilation. It's further forward in time. It's further away from the Big Bang. It's, it's this picture right here. Uh, yeah. It's this picture right here. Because it's heavier, it's further away from this point here. Earth is lighter, so it has less time dilation, so it's less distance from this. And of course, the moon has less than the Earth, so it's closer to the, to the Big Bang. It's in the past. But then, but then on Earth, uh, you have an apple. So the, this, the, this given apple is, uh, has the same time like Earth or different time? <laughs> You're thinking Earth as a 3D solid with no gradient. Time is gradually changing as we go through the planet. The core is a lot younger than the, the surface. Uh, your, head is, your head is aging faster than your feet. That, that's a gradient. It's not a, solid, it's, it's, a, it's not a solid 3D surface as far as time. So the apple, apple just wants to go forward in time. The future is still at the center of the Earth. The apple just wants to, it's, it's charge. Is, is, is charge. The apple just wants to go there because it's, it's, they're, it's drawn to it. So even if the earth had just, it was a, if the earth was a monopole and didn't have a, any gradient, uh, I don't even think that would even work. But because the earth has a gradient, the reason why we get pulled down when we fall out of planes or everything, because we still, our mass instinctively wants to go to the future at the core of this planet. All matter does. But Tony, how do you deal with uh, causality? Causality? Oh, do you need a scenario for a breaking causality? Yeah, for for in, in general, uh, we we think that time is uh, linked to causality. So mm -hmm. in order, like no, no, no. Uh, past, yeah, but past give me a scenario that you think it may this may break causality. Causality is still enforced. It just doesn't break causality, even though that black hole is in the future, it doesn't break causality because it's not letting us get any information from it from the future that we can use. Uh, the, the neutrons, well, let's do something simple. And, and if we get any useful information from the sun, well, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light anyway. So even though the star is in the future, the information is, is still traveling backwards to get to us. Okay, so you you can travel in time, backward. I I, I didn't. I, I I I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> that if if it's a sound theory. This would this would make me believe that time travelers maybe may be possible if you could learn from it, learn the science of something new and how it works. I'm not going to say any more fast. Well, I, taking I, this picture, going from from Earth to Moon would. How do you go? I well, you, would have traveled back in time. You would have traveled, but you travel back in time all the time. Every time you go from the ground floor up to the to the penthouse, you mm. are leaving that gravity well. You're you're leaving. Your time is getting faster because you're leaving the time dilation that's here at the surface. You're you travel back in time. We all travel back in time all the time. Now I don't think we can go as ever as far back as the Big Bang time, but we travel through time all the time, backwards and forwards. Every time you stand up, you're traveling backwards in time. Every time you go up in a plane, you're traveling backwards in time. You're leaving the gravity well of this planet. Your clock is getting faster. Which has been proven on, on atomic clocks that have been, you know, as atomic clocks on the top floor tick slower than, I'm sorry, tick faster than the clocks on the, on the bottom floor. <laughs> This is, well, this, is, this is well known. <laughs> Excuse me, I would have to take issue with that statement. The rate of time is slower, closer to the Earth, and faster, further from it, uh, due to the redshift, which I discussed in my own talk. But in both cases, you're going forwards in time, just the rate at which you go forwards is different. That's very different from saying backwards in time. That, that I agree with, and I have a problem with that. So the way I have to see this, this is a river. And even though I may be going down river, but I le I'm leaving my boat, swimming away from my boat, I'm still ultimately still going down river. If you look at this, this is what it looks like to me. 
look at this picture. <laughs> if everything is doing this, everything's doing this throughout time. They're still in step. It looks like the shock wave from the Big Bang. It looks like this is the shock wave. This is everything that's 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 trailed out from the Big Bang when it went kaboom. You know, objects went forward in time. I mean, objects are back, but if you just follow its progression, you know, a second is still still a second for these guys. So time is still ticking unison for them. So yes, yeah, so if I was to, I don't know if you see my cursor, but if I was to leave the gravity well of the star and go up, that's why I made sure I said in my paper, you're leaving the future from that region. I, I specifically said that because I didn't want it to be inferred that I can go back to the beginning of time and say hi and look at the Big Bang firsthand. What I what I what I meant by that is that from that region that even there's a gradient around this body of the star. So compared to everything up here is the past, compared to everything down here is the future. So if I was to leave the star, I'm leaving the future from that region. I was specific about that because even though I may get off this body, as I said here, everything is still moving forward in time. That would have to include me. The only way I can get off this this wave is if I got to travel faster than the speed of light, I believe. And I don't think, well, we all know how we, that's not that possible. So even though I would be leaving the future in that region, globally, I'm still moving forward in time. So yes, and it took me a while to, to wrap my head around that, that there's a, there's a shock wave leaving the Big Bang. And even if I sort of kick away from the sun to kind of what I'm thinking is coming backwards, I'm still ultimately still in the shockwave, still going forward in time. Um, I have a sense that there's a bit of a confusion of categories here between mass and time. And to help me understand better what you're after, I'd like to ask if there are experimental or observational differences you would expect from your approach to time and gravity over our uh, current understanding of these things. No, see, this is the thing about this. This this doesn't replace general relativity. I never said, I'm never claiming that general relativity has a problem. The only thing I had a issue with was the, that visual image that got passed around that Einstein himself never agreed with. I don't, Einstein deserves his credit where credit is due. He deserved it. I'm not, this has nothing about doing about going, breaking relativity or, or, or relativity was wrong. Uh, this is just going a step further and maybe an understanding of something most people always, this debate is about time. There's a reason why we were all called here. We all we were all picked because someone believes that we have some quantum leap notion of at least a hope of understanding of what time may actually is. It's the ultimate mystery. You, you know what it is before someone asks you what it is. And the moment you, they ask you, you, no one knows what it is. We sense it, but we can't measure it. Um, and it was never been a... a if you can't put it in an equation, it doesn't exist. You know, we, we, it doesn't, it's a myth. And so this was only filling in that last piece of the puzzle that had Einstein just looked back on those bodies. If he could have gone to those bodies and looked back and he could measure how far away the Big Bang was, he would have saw a difference. And that difference was only in time. And he would have, he, General Ritzley would have still been the same. But now he would have understood how how mass and gravity are actually holding hands. What's what's connecting them? Um, and as I said, Newton didn't have a chance because he didn't even know about time dilation. But this equation here is uh, it says a lot. You know, it's, this is the only variable changing in this whole equation, and this is what I refer to as temporal charge. It's, it's a quantity because e, if this is the mass that's from E equals mc squared, that equivalent says that down the line, this must be that E. There's nothing else here. Gravitational constant, size, that's just volume, speed of light, this thing right here, and it's spitting out the exact values of mass. And this can't be a coincidence that it's the exact same distance from the Big Bang. It, 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 it can't be a coincidence. All right. Okay. Well, that is that is my presentation. I, I'm glad you all stayed and listened to it. Uh, if anyone wants to, I said it's my last shot of the my URL. 
uh, with the zip file of my paper, uh, the other paper, and my slides here. But thank you so much for your time. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Tony, for your presentation.